It's uh, truly an honor to be here today, and, and thank you, Joe, for the introduction. It's humbling to be introduced by someone like yourself, and I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, my, my research over the past four years is really in a number of areas which I hope to touch on today. And the first is how can smart grid be behave as sort of an economic engine to you know, grow a region or a country's economy. And I think uh, with that the point about 40% reduced outages is just one example of getting some payback from these investments. It's the second area is how can the US, and you've got Patricia Hoffman here from the DOE today, which is an, like another you know, real privilege for us. How can the US become a technology leader in this field? And beyond that, how can we, as we shift into renewable energies, really achieve en energy independence? Um, so there's this idea that really renewables cannot scale without a true smart grid in place. So um, that's, those are just three topics. The, but the fourth, and this is very <coughs> critical, and it speaks to the products that SNC is producing, is the reliability of the grid. And you know, how can we, as the US economy, run a 21st century digital economy using the 20th century grid that you know, looks very familiar to what Thomas Edison invented and you know, helped to install? And then beyond that, when we think about smart grids, all of the new services that become available as end-to-end -end communications get embedded. So uh, thinking about how in the future we can get a text message if our power goes down or if our, our mother or grandmother is on medical equipment, how we can you know, have instant uh, awareness to situations where power is not available and uh, other services beyond that as we sort of look to the cloud to pull information about how the grid is performing in real time. And, uh, and that leads us into this, probably the biggest uh, uh, area of investment right now in the country, if you go to Silicon Valley, is big data. And with the, the shift, it, it, with the advent of smart metering, where you're checking meters not once a month, but maybe once every 15 minutes, you've just increased your data collection by a, you know, 9,000 times. So that's a big challenge. And then I'd like to, with the panel, kind of talk about what's coming up around the bend. So those are basically the areas that I've been researching and that I'm very happy to kind of kick off the discussion today. And I'm very happy to be joined uh, on my direct left with Tom Ed Webb, who's the president of the Chattanooga Chamber. Uh, next to him, as I mentioned, is Patricia Hoffman, who is the assistant secretary of the DOE. We've got the CEO of John Etsy, uh, C president and CEO at SNC, John Etsy, next to Patricia. And then at the end is uh, Howard DePriest, who's the CEO of EPB. So uh, a really distinguished panel, and uh, I'm really happy to be here and share this day with all of you. So I think first maybe we can just jump into this, this question of, and this I think probably speaks to uh, your concerns, Tom, and in, in looking at these investments for your city, and you know, how, how in fact can we run a 21st century economy using a 20th century grid? And, and what, is, what are the paybacks, and how can we think about smart grid as an economic engine for, for jobs, and as we kind of uh, increasingly become a more digital economy, and uh, you know, as issues of reliability uh, start to kind of, you know, especially in this region where tornadoes is an issue, as these kind of issues become more and more apparent. So uh, I'll start with you, Tom. Well, it sounds like you put all of the things you were talking about into one question there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, let, let, let me talk uh, a, a minute about uh, uh, the part of being competitive and how in the 21st century and so on and so forth. Uh, Chattanooga has come a long way for the ones of you that are here that are not from Chattanooga. We haven't always had the uh, uh, beautiful city uh, and all of the uh, the sights that you can see when you walk the streets. It didn't used to be that way. Uh, so to get to where we are today, uh, Chattanooga has accomplished more than and most cities in this country uh, have accomplished. The uh, true re reality about economic development is that it's a very competitive game. And when we talk to companies uh, that are want to look at Chattanooga, they don't come in and say, we're looking just at Chattanooga, so tell us what you have. We're one of a number of cities and areas that they're looking at, uh, and each one of those cities or areas have assets to offer. So it's a very, very competitive game, and when we started 
trying to sell Chattanooga uh, to site selectors about 10 years ago, we commissioned a company to do a study for us uh, nationally and basically answer the question, uh, what's your opinion of Chattanooga? And uh, so our consultant came back and said, well, the, the, the good is that, or the bad is that there's nobody out there got an opinion of Chattanooga. <laughs> and the good is that there's nobody out there got an opinion of Chattanooga. He said, you all are totally neutral. Nobody really knows about Chattanooga, Tennessee. So uh, we accepted that as really good news and said, okay, this is a chance to build on something and to create an image, and we did that. The public-private partnership, and I've got to mention that, I don't believe, and I'm most sincere about this, that ten uh, Chattanooga would be anywhere near where it is today if the public sectors and the private sectors of this community had not come together years ago and gotten by uh, a number of issues that affect other cities and learned how to work together for the good of the community. It's been proven that that works because Chattanooga is where it is today because of that. And then, then we changed a brownfield into a world-class, attractive industrial park that we used as a, something to sell. That was sort of like the gigabit is now. Uh, that was something that Chattanooga had that very few other places had. And we used that to attract Volkswagen. Volkswagen, Amazon, Alstom, other companies got Chattanooga on the map, and we get a lot of visits from companies now simply because they want to see why Chattanooga was able to do what they've done. Then along comes EPB with this wonderful gigabit. Now, I'm not an engineer, so if I mispronounce some of the stuff here, you'll forgive me, but uh, we got that, and, and I can tell you from experience, I remember one, for instance, where we were sitting down in the boardroom of the chamber and we were recruiting a company that this has been two years ago probably that's here by the way and that uh, came here with a, a number of jobs and has already increased that number of jobs since they've been here and and uh, the EPB was there and we were talking about the gigabit and this and the smart grid and so on and what all that could do and I remember one person said to the the CEO of that company asked one of his people what that means, and he told him that that means that households in Chattanooga have faster access to, uh, to computers and worldwide information than we have right now at our call centers down in Florida. And that, that was a true eye-opener. We got that company, and I, I can assure you that the only reason we did was because that uh, of EPB's product. So moving forward, I, uh, this, this really puts Chattanooga in the forefront, I think, of cities in the country. I've said before, and I say it again, I think at least 95% of the, of the cities in this country would change places with Chattanooga, Tennessee right now if they could, because we've got all the things that they're trying to get. They don't have a gigabit. They don't have Volkswagen. They don't have all these things that this public-private partnership has captured for us. So from an economic development point of view, we're happy it's here. It gives us a wonderful opportunity to go out and recruit using that as a primary tool, something we have that nobody else has. Thank you, Tom. That was a great answer to my question and also a great introduction. I probably should allow each of the speakers to first also introduce what you're working on. So here we have Patricia Hoffman. Well, I'm just going to continue with the conversation that's been started. First of all, thank you all for having me here. I, I really appreciate being here. For me, it's, it's, it's exciting to see technology and strategy and vision come together and all those components really fit together for meaningful development. I appreciate all the partners here because everyone has a role to play. and. This is what we're about, is doing our job in building community and then being able to actually demonstrate the success. From the Department of Energy's point of view, our vision is really to partner with the electric utilities in adding technology and innovation in the distribution, transmission sections of the electric sector. What we really want to do is demonstrate the value to customers 
but also showing how the utilities can maintain and technology advancements can actually provide additional services and additional capabilities. Some people use the medical analogy of going from an x-ray to an MRI and the additional capability that doctors have in providing services to customers. In some way, what we're doing is adding additional capability that's adding value-added services. There were things talked about more having the system be more efficient, being able to provide improved services with respect to outage management, asset management. Um, I could name just those, but we could go on further on discussions on different values and different services that are being provided to consumers. But as part of that is really part of the larger picture, which is the economic development. It is the role of electricity and reliability in attracting manufacturing, attracting businesses, attracting um, other capabilities to a community as we look at development. So even though the Department of Energy has only had a small role, we're, we're really proud of our role and what we have done in supporting the, the utilities and the investments. We have over 130 projects across the United States in which we're investing in technology and innovation it's four and a half billion dollars of investment in the U.S. economy and the U.S. infrastructure. And we want to see results. We want to be able to show with projects that, like EPB the value that is being achieved from these investments and the, cons and the support that we're showing for customers. So with that, we're looking forward to the future of what is the next generation. How can we in continue to integrate cleaner technologies, renewable energy, energy storage, other capabilities uh, as the system continues to evolve in services? So thank you. Thanks, Patricia. And I, I really agree with that point. It's one thing to be invested in the research and the data, but to see something uh, deployed and installed, to see it really come to life was, was phenomenal. And so I, with that, I'll hand it off to John, who is the CEO of SNC Electric. I'm John Estia, president of SNC, and we're the uh, proud inventors and producers of the uh, interrupter pulse closer that was uh, installed today. There were only I was proud to hear that it was hoisted. I was proud to hear that it was raised. It was nice to hear it was mounted. The only two things I took umbrage at this morning. One was it being hung. <laughs> Not sure you want to have your offspring hung. <laughs> but the most discouraging was the notion that this is the last Interruptor EPB is going to install, and I'm sure that's not true. <laughs> SNC is certainly not a household name, so for those who weren't there this morning, uh, you should at least know we are an employee-owned company. We're headquartered in Chicago. We have over 2,600 employees worldwide. Uh, last year we celebrated our centennial, so we're 100 years old, but we are young at heart and we're still growing. Our job is to solve problems that are not being solved by what's available today uh, in the electric power industry. And so Interruptor is just one of the things that we have invented, um, which at some point, David, we can explain what that is. Why don't we do that right now? Because right. I think that's probably on top of mind for a lot of the audience. So you saw this, this gizmo hanging on the pole, this 1,100 pounds of intelligence. Um, you know, for a lot of people, the smart grid, people who read the, the, just the paper and don't pay much attention, the smart grid is about advanced meters. Uh, in truth, that is the, uh, that isn't the, even the tip of the tip of the iceberg. The smart grid is really about trying to make electric power so it does serve 20, 21st century needs. This thing we make, the Interrupter, is one of our whole array of smart grid products, but this one is put out on the distribution system. It sits there carrying current, directing current, good weather and bad. Of course, it's bad weather, you mostly need it. But it is amazing how many outages occur in the middle of the day, so the drunks apparently are able to hit poles uh, when it's not night. And these things go out onto the system, and they actually talk to each other using EPB's high-speed fiber optic network, and that's an important ingredient in the smart grid. And so they talk to each other, and then, you know, the drunk hits the pole, or there is a disturbance. These things can very quickly identify where the disturbance is, can very quickly isolate the disturbance, and even better, get the power flowing to all the homes and businesses that power can still reach. And it does that in seconds, using the fiber optic network very, very quickly. It actually allows the utility to go from the mode 
where you're sitting there wondering if any, someone has an outage, you're waiting for them to call you. Now EPB is in the enviable position of having to actually communicate to their customers and say, oh, by the way, our system operated today so you didn't have an outage. It's an unusual situation. But these gizmos, when they are done doing all that, keeping the power flowing, also send a message to EPB saying, here's the problem. You can send your crews to fix it. In the old days, what would happen? They'd get all these calls, figure out where the problem is, send guys out, drive around, find the problem, do a bunch of switching to isolate the problem, do more switching to get the lights back on, and then finally go to solve the problem. These gizmos allow them to go directly to solving the problem. So this is the kind of thing that the smart grid can do. And there are a lot of other things. You talk about this economic engine thing. I was in Singapore 10 years ago, and Singapore was quite upset. The average customer, electric customer in the United States is out of power two hours a year. Singapore was upset because their average customer was out of power 30 seconds a year. And that was too long. Why is that too long? Because they're trying to attract high tech business. This is a very, very competitive world. Chattanooga is not just competing with Nashville or Memphis, but with Singapore and all around the world because these high tech companies have no loyalty. So go where the deal is best for them. And so this is a huge economic weapon. It also, of course, if we're, in a, if we're producing things, interrupters or whatever, and our power goes out, suddenly our people become pretty unproductive. So if we're competing elsewhere in the world and we're out of power two hours a year, that's an expensive two hours. We somehow have to put in our prices. You give me power that's on all the time, I can, I'm that much better at competing around the world. So what's happened here in Chattanooga is absolutely world leading and is something that everybody here should be proud of, especially the folks who've done it. Uh, but we're proud to have been part of this project, which I think uh, everybody who's been involved should be uh, able to claim as a major success. Thanks, John. I touched on a lot there, and I'm going to carry a lot of those elements forward in this conversation. But uh, last but not least, let's uh, get to Harold. And maybe, Harold, you can kind of, along with the economic benefits, discuss just how critical fiber has been to this project and kind of what that allows that may otherwise be more difficult to, to install. Well, the, the reality is what, what fiber does is give you instantaneous communications. Uh, how many of you remember when you first got a PC on your desk? Some of you can remember. You may remember that in the old days, they didn't talk to each other. First PCs were standalone. You might be able to put a floppy disk in and swap it from one machine to the other, but basically they were not much more than great big adding machines and typewriters. We didn't understand the power of the PC until we had a communication system that let PCs talk to PCs. Well, that's what we're doing with these interrupters. Uh, what we have is 1,170 devices that have a great deal of intelligence. They're little computers, literally. And the fiber connects them together so that basically they all look like they're, they're the computers networked in your office. Suddenly you can share files, you can move data, you can do intelligent things much better with a large group of intelligent devices than you can with one or two. Let me tell you a, a very simple story that would make the point of why smart grid is, is necessary today. EPB began serving uh, power in this community in 1939. We serve a little community down in Georgia, Hinkle, Georgia. How many of you know where Hinkle, Georgia is? In the early days, the people of Hinkle didn't have telephones, okay? So when the power would go out, they would drop us a postcard. Okay? I'm serious. We, we would get a postcard that would say, hey, uh, the power's out down here in Hinkle. Uh, you know, the next time you're down here, you might want to put the lights back on. Last week, David and his people were dealing with an industrial customer that had an outage at their facility because they had seen a voltage drop to 70% for one cycle. That's 1 60th of a second, okay? So we've gone from postcards saying, hey, the power's out, to customers that have equipment that is so sensitive, they can see something that happens faster than you can see it happen, okay? That's, that's where we are in today's world. We have that type of need. And think about just from the residential side. When we started producing electricity and, and distributing it in the valley, we were competing with kerosene lamps, right? Now, I grew up on a farm. We still had our kerosene lamps because if the cows rubbed against the guy wires, our lights went out, and we would, turn, we would get that kerosene lamp, and we could still see. It's not that way today, is it? Every device you have in your house has become not a luxury. It's become a necessity. 
modern life is dependent on those devices working and working all the time. We had uh, a series of tornadoes last April. We had nine tornadoes that hit us over a period of about 12 hours. And in the end, when, when the last winds blew through that night at midnight, we had 130,000 homes and businesses without power. I've never seen the city so dark in, in my life. That was three out of four customers were without power. If we had had the interrupters installed at that point in time, my best estimate is that about 70,000 people would not have seen their power go out. Now that's huge. When you start thinking that's a whole city all by itself. That's why smart grid makes all kinds of sense. The other thing is simply, if you do it well, it pays for itself. Now how, how many investments can you think of in which you spend the money to build something, it renders a valuable service and pays for itself. That's sort of the American way, is it not? <laughs> so, you know, I think what people need to understand is we, we went to the fiber because we had all of these electronic devices on the electric system, but they couldn't communicate. And we knew we were going to build some sort of communication system. The question was, which decision will future-proof the decisions we're making? What decision can you make today that will not seem stupid in 10 years? And as we analyzed it, what we realized is the fastest communications devices or the fastest communication system that you can afford is the one you will regret the least in the future. So that's where smart grid comes from, and that's why the idea for us is that fiber is the right tool to communicate with. And David, if yeah. I could just tag on to the story that uh, Harold said about the customer that saw the 70% dip in voltage for a measly 160th of a second. They called out and said, you knocked my plant out of power. Mm. EPB, this is an example of customer service in the smart grid world. EPB is able to download through the fiber optic network a waveform that was captured by the interrupter and stored in memory, in non-volatile memory. They look at that, went to the customer and said, here, that's how they knew it was a 70% dip for just one sixtieth of a second, and said to that customer, let's work on what you have and the settings in your plant, because that's actually what knocked you out of power. And they were able to help them change the, some of the overly sensitive settings in their plant now they can ride through, which is really a pretty minuscule dip in power caused by almost anything. And it could be counties away and cause that kind of a disturbance. And so it's a good example of how customer service can really move up when you have that kind of data and you can use the fiber optic network to move it around and to analyze it back at, at your desk. I think it's a great example of what can be done. I do too, because you got John and Harold, you just touched on two of, I think, the most fascinating aspects of the smart grid. And one of those is, hardware talking to hardware and machine-to-machine -machine communication. So this is sort of the birth of the Internet of Things. So if you think about the world going forward, this is the industry that's pioneering a lot of these innovations. And secondly, with the Intellirupt, you're talking about distributed intelligence. So unlike a model where there's centralized control and command and you're whispering down the lane what devices should do, here the device is at the edge, and that's really the smart grid, edge intelligence, are communicating with each other and with the customer, and it's really facilitating a whole new paradigm of, of computing and, and speed. So uh, thank you for those comments. Um, in thinking about, this is maybe to Patricia, the RF stimulus funding, the majority of, the, of those funds went to smart metering, and I think I'm just hypothesizing, but meters are something that customers tangibly can understand and get their arms around. And so in terms of you know, asking for billions of dollars, that maybe made sense from a political sense or you know, persuasion. But in terms of these investments, it seems to me in a lot of my research that DA, distribution automation, these kinds of critical control and protection investments really have a fast ROI, ROI return on investment, number one. And two, in an age where there is some consumer backlash to the smart meter in parts of the country, namely in California, where all kinds of issues have been raised. I mean, silly stuff, but the point is people have been mobilized to sort of oppose the smart grid. T to my eye, I think DA makes a lot of sense now, and I think, uh, you know, maybe can I get your opinion on how you see the different uh, values of the different submarkets, or how we should think about that, or? Yes. Um, I I guess I would start off with the smart grid is more, more than just about smart meters. It's our investment on the distribution system, the transmission system, 
It's providing value-added services. The, the, the value-added near-term return on investment, you get easier return or, or more apparent return on investment as you look at the transmission and distribution system. The harder linkage is the linkage to the customer because as you look at the data that's provided from the meters, it is, are we at a point that there's value-added services that are being provided to the customer? And I think that is still being developed. I think that is still maturing as an industry. Whereas when we look at the advances that we can achieve on the distribution system with voltage op optimization, with outage management, even the um, wide area visualization on the transmission system, we have the infrastructure in place and we can see those gains faster and quicker. On the customer side, we're making some inroads. Uh, one point that we're s starting to see some advancements, actually there's several areas we're starting to see some advancements. The outage management, uh, communications with the customers, services, whether it's a disabled customer, et cetera, there's a lot of value there. The second thing is uh, through the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, Utilities are coming together and actually providing their information in a standardized, downloadable data format, which uh, we're calling the green button, which parallels the medical analogy uh, that they're doing with the medical services. But what that allows is third-party developers to take the data in a standardized format and provide value-added services. It was one of those linchpin uh, opportunities where we can actually take the smart grid to the next level and looking at customer service. And so what now now is happening is application developers are really starting to provide some tailored tools to show value added to customers. One example that's being developed in California is sizing of solar systems for uh, residential uh, for residences in California and how can you right size some of those solar panels to, to their usage pattern so they actually can get the biggest bang for the dollar. So I think what you will now start seeing is once the data has been unleashed in a standardized format, you'll start seeing some value added come on the consumer side from third party applications. But I think from the utility side, there's still a lot of value add to the consumers in pr improving the relationship and the dialogue between the utility and the customers to also allowing for uh, trust and diagnostics to occur and understanding what is happening on their system, why is power being wasted. Also for prepay and other type of programs that are quite creative and providing support to customers. Thank you, Patricia. And I agree with those comments. I think there's value on, on both op optimizing the grid and turning on the, the consumers. Harold, one thing you said to me on the bus ride over here is that having fiber, most utilities are aiming to have hourly or 15 minute reads but that would allow you to do virtually uh, reads every minute if you wanted to. Can you maybe discuss some of the services or features you, you imagine in the future if you, if you were to do something like that? Or, yeah. yeah. Now, I, I'll have to tell you that when, what I imagine is always very, very simple. It's not very complex <laughs> at all. Uh, one of the things that happens when you put smart meters out there is that you can read the usage. That really is a very small thing. We don't think that's a big deal at all. But the other thing that happens is that you wind up having, in our case, we'll have 170,000 sensors out there that will help us monitor power quality. It will let us literally know what's happening. And when you, when you have the understanding of what's happening on your electric system, you have the ability to respond in, an, in a logical, well thought out way uh, I'll give you something as simple as uh, Chattanooga, look at our beautiful mountains. We, we have a heck of a time getting trucks up on those mountains in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. Get a little bit of snow and ice and you just can't hardly get up there. But let's say we're up there and we're having an ice storm and we start restoring power. We start building back the broken poles and wires. One of the things you want to know real quickly is, okay, I think I'm through in this area. Is there anybody whose power is still out before I pull my tr crews off? Because if I pull them off, it's going to take me an hour or two to even get back up there. Mm -hmm. With the smart meters, one of the things that we know is instantaneously, we know who's out, we know who came back. You, you don't think of that, but we see it going out and we see it coming back as we repair <coughs> in a given area. That just lets us come by and keep your power on before we drive off the mountain. That's a small thing, 
it's pretty important if you're the one who might be sitting there for three or four hours once we leave the area. <coughs> the other thing is, I think this is probably going to be near and dear to Pat's heart, letting people understand their energy usage as it occurs. Uh, what we do today is we send you a bill 30 days after you use the power. It's not very helpful. You can read the bill and figure out what you're going to do next month, but guess what? Next month's different. If you can see your power usage literally on a 15-minute interval basis, I can understand what I've done. Now, you're not going to think that's really a very sexy application. It's kind of silly. On the other hand, you might want to know it's two weeks into the month. I've already spent 150 bucks. Maybe I better cut the thermostat back just a little bit. We think giving people that type of information. Uh, <laughs> one of the one of the uh, points that, that Dave made a little bit earlier was that we live in an age today where people anticipate instantaneous information. We get impatient if we stand in the line or we drive up in line at, at a McDonald's and we have to wait two minutes to get our hamburger. Now, most of us grew up when it took an hour to cook our meal, and we get impatient after a minute or two. But do we not, as electric companies, have to understand that that's inherent in the way people feel today and in terms of what they are looking for in terms of service? So what I think the smart grid is mainly going to do is to make it interactive with the consumers in a way that is very transparent, giving them information that they want on an instantaneous basis. If you're giving them information after the fact, what have you really done? Not a whole lot. If you tell them information as it's occurring, you give them the ability to take actions that are necessary to them, to their life. I think the real issue, this is sounds silly, but the American people for the last century have traded their money for comfort and convenience. Now, now think about it, is that not what we've all done? That's the reason we're in line at McDonald's, okay? It's very, very convenient. And when we go home, we want comfort. I don't think we're going to give that up. But I think having a smart grid, if consumers trust their electric company, we can help them reduce energy usage and reduce costs to the entire community without infringing <coughs> on that comfort and convenience. And I think that's going to be the real killer app for the smart grid. Yep. Uh, comment? One thing that I'd say to, to follow on what Harold said and what Pat said is that the smart grid isn't a bunch of technology. It really depends on implementation. I have a meter on my house in Chicago that I call potentially smart. I get, I get an estimated bill every other month, which has to tell you on the odd months somebody's running out there to read this thing. So it's got smarts that are not being used. The payback, the original payback on the smart meter was to allow the, an interchange of information so that you could be told as a consumer the price of power is now this and the price of power is now this and, oh my god the price of power is this I better do something and then actions will be taken. I, I don't know the number but I'll bet you 80 percent of the so-called smart meters in the country have no such communication going on and I probably am underestimating it. What you need is people that understand the applications and how to knit these things together because it isn't about smart meters, it isn't about interrupters, it's how all this stuff plays together. You've got a smart meter, you now know where the outages are. You have a smart meter, you now know the voltage at every single point on your system that matters, which is where the customer is taking service. You have interrupters out there, very precise voltage measurements, know exactly what the voltage is along the line. You combine those two things, you can now implement a thing that's called, let's just call it voltage optimization for simplicity, where you can now flatten out the voltage on the line, which isn't flat today, and you can move it up or down, and you can actually help consumers save money without them lifting a finger. But you have to get all the pieces playing together, and you have to have someone really with a vision to tie them all together, and then you've got something in the smart grid that actually helps the economy and helps the, the consumers. Today, there are a lot of practitioners like the one operating my potentially smart meter that haven't tied those pieces together yet and I'm, I'm fearful that they're going to give the so-called smart grid a bad name. I was saying to Pat at lunch that my bet is in 10 years they won't dare call it the smart grid because that was a thing that didn't work. This thing can work. We just need good implementers who can put the pieces together and make them interoperate successfully. Thank you, uh, John. And I think that leads into my next question which is in thinking of making a holistic system 
uh, where is the opportunity for big data and analytics to start to have things like multi-factor anomaly assessment where you're bringing, bringing, streams of data, <coughs> excuse me, bringing streams of data together like a last gas meters message, a transformer no anomaly, even social media data where some customers tweeting that their power is out and all of that's merging into a system that understands and can react. I mean, that, that to me looks like a big part of the promise in getting consumers their payback for their investments in smart meters and really bringing the, the sort of the systems level approach to the smart grid. Uh, comments? Well, one thing I'd say to that is that, uh, you know, that we're all limited by our imaginations. And the, the immediate thing we think about is, oh, we gotta bring all that back and we can merge it all together. But in truth, that's not how anything works. That's not how our companies work. That isn't even how our families work. We, we all operate on distributing the decisions and distributing, and therefore the data is naturally distributed. Where you want decisions made is where the decision is most effectively made. And so, uh, for instance, in the, uh, the, the uh, substations that EPB has, they have transformers. These transformers are worth half a million dollars each. On sitting on one of those is a relay. Its job is to protect it. If there's something happens bad in that transformer within, you know, a sixtieth of a second, a decision has to be made, an action has to be taken, or that thing's blowing up. So you put the decision right there. The only thing that needs to come back is, this is what I saw, this is what I did. Not all the data that was in there. It's the same thing with these interrupters. They're out there, they're talking to each other, they're getting buckets of information. None of that information is really useful until there's a disturbance. Then they take action, and then they send back to EPB or wherever the, the, uh, the utility is, what happened, what I do about it. You don't need to bring mountains of data back. Let's use distributed intelligence to have the decisions made where the decisions are most useful and are best made, and don't bother bringing back mountains of data. So that's, that's sort of the first step, is let's, let's, let's get the data where it's needed and, and, and don't pass it around, just do something about it, and only send me what's important. That will cut that mountain down to, a, not a molehill, but something smaller that we can then manage. And that's certainly one step that can be done. Other thoughts or comments? Well, I, I would just say I think, uh, uh, I mentioned to you earlier that I think one of the interesting things that Smart Grid is going to do is that utilities are going to wind up being much more interested in statistical information than we ever have been because we've never had statistical information. All of a sudden, we're going to have real data and the, now I'm a, I'm a contrary thinker. I, I don't think the smart grid is about smart technology. That's absolutely a part of it. The real issue is smart people. The real issue is having people who can take that data and figure out how to use it to operate the system in a way that benefits customers. In the end, if it's not about comfort and convenience in the home and consistency of power for businesses, I, I don't really know what it is. Uh, but I think that the smart grid gives us the ability to put a level of reliability and of the, the term we're using is saying we're trying to make our system interactive, meaning that you as a consumer today have very little control over your electricity. I mean, there's a fiction that you can just go change the thermostat. How many of you like to have your house colder than it ought to be in the winter or hotter than it ought to be in the summer? The reality is that's not how the life works, right? So our issue is to look at ways that we can deliver power to you in a way that lets you live your life much more comfortably. If the notion is that we're gonna, as a nation, achieve energy efficiency by getting you to be uncomfortable, you're not gonna play. I mean, that's, just, that's just the reality. We have to find ways that we can do things together. Uh, and, and the, but the funny thing is, when we do things together, we suddenly get major impacts. Uh, if you turn your thermostat down one degree in the, in the winter, probably no impact whatsoever. If we swing tens of thousands of thermostats one degree, nothing really bad happens to any of us, but we have a major impact on the energy usage at that point in time in this city. That's the type of thing that we're gonna be able to do with this technology. I, I wanna open the, uh, the, uh, the floor to questions from the audience. But first, being that there's a lot of political and business leaders in the room, I want to get back to this issue of uh, this market as an economic engine. One thing that wasn't discussed is the growth of data centers as, as a percentage of the U.S. Uh, electricity consumption. I think it's lasted like about five percent of our electricity, and you know issues of quality, uh, power quality are obviously critical there. In terms of attracting 
the Amazons of the world into your region. I mean, maybe you could talk a bit more about uh, you know, the role for redundancy. We talk about redundancy in, in networking all the time, but in power, it's rare. And it's, trust me, EPB is very innovative and very leading edge in thinking about power in this way. So maybe the role of redundancy in, in attracting, having the power quality to attract major talent into a region and, or into a country. Oh, I'll, I'll kick that off. Uh, has anybody here ever been to a hospital? Okay. Every hospital that I know in Chattanooga has dual feeds. It has dual feeds for a simple reason. You wouldn't want to be lying on the operating table and say, oops, the lights are out. That, that actually happened to me one time. I was, in a, <laughs> <laughs> I was in a dentist's office in Pune in India, and they'd numb my, my gums. And uh, the power went out. And uh, by the time the power came back on, an hour and a half later, they went into drill, and I got a shock like you wouldn't. <laughs> so I can speak to you. You just ruined my example. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me make the point on it, though. Uh, it isn't just hospitals. Hospitals have an obvious life-saving reason for it. But there are there are businesses and industries that have that same need for reliable power. Uh, in the old days when we, we dealt with Invista, when, when they were DuPont, they made nylon fibers. Uh, the fibers were strung through the literally small glass tubes that the filaments went through. If you had a power outage, the stuff just froze in the tubes and then they had to break them down. And uh, I, I've had a plant manager call and say, you just cost me $175,000. You really love those types of calls when you're running an electric company. But the truth is, that's the type of thing that happens. Businesses today, a lot of industry is continuous, duty cycle, they're running all the time, and it is gonna be incumbent on us to come up with ways to keep the power on. What these interrupters do is give us the equivalent of dual feeds to just almost every business on our system. And what that means is the lights don't go off as often, they'll still go off, if a tree falls on a line, it's still gonna be a problem but not near as many businesses are gonna see it. And they don't, um, a common thing we'll get is uh, a, a plant manager has a small manufacturing facility and lights go out and they're talking to us saying, how quick are you gonna get the power back on because they've got to decide, do they send first shift home or do they keep them there to get the plant going again when the lights come back? And that's as simple and common sense as it can be. So to the extent that we can segment off that that damaged area and keep that from happening, we'll be contributing greatly to that business's ability to succeed. It, it's, in the end, it comes down to economics in the sense of measuring the good to society. You know, I might just add, that's Harold's part of the equation. I don't get those calls. Um, I wouldn't know how to answer them if I got them. Uh, all I do is sell the fact that they can call Harold uh, <laughs> if it doesn't work. But you mentioned Amazon. Uh, I, I, I don't think Amazon would be here. Well, let me, let me rephrase it. I think, uh, I think the uh, EPB's ability to deliver their products to the marketplace that we've been discussing had a big impact on Amazon being here in Chattanooga. Uh, and if they had not uh, landed here, I don't think they would have uh, expanded uh, up, up in Cleveland and uh, maybe in the rest of the state. Uh, we've got some companies here that are here totally because of, of uh, EPB and, and, the, and the products that they sell. Well, what, what, what it did for us, it gave us not just a product to sell, it gave us an attitude to sell. Uh, I think companies like to come into a city and see and meet people that get along together, that understand the needs of business, the things you've just heard here, even the small things like the lights going out. Uh, companies recognize that when they come into a community. They send professionals in and they know how to read a community. And so we're selling an attitude, an attitude that Chattanooga can do whatever it takes to uh, get your company here. We've got the products, we've got the services, we've got the people, we've got the workforce, and we've done it uh, for years and we know how to do it. So it's, it's, an, it's an attitude seller for, for us. And uh, cities like Kansas City, which is still behind us, I think, in, with, even with the help of Google, uh, has, has, uh, would like to trade places with Chattanooga. So 
the uh, the industries that you mentioned will all eventually uh, be op there'll be opportunities here for them to come and look and see uh, other companies that have settled here, like HomeServe yeah. and others, that use those products. And if I can just add to that, another thing that is a great compliment is also the workforce development. I, you know, did not bring it up earlier, but University of Tennessee Chattanooga and the workforce development, the partnership with the community, in creating quality jobs, but in continuing that feedback loop into the workforce and the partnership between universities and the community college, is an is an important value added component. So. When it comes to data centers, I think Chattanooga's done something brilliant here because data centers only care about two things, fiber and power. I was at a data center, uh, we, we build infrastructure for data centers, and I was at one recently that had, has a uh, peak load capability of 182 megawatts, which is probably 15% of Chattanooga's peak load in one little building. And uh, the guy took me into a room and he said, see this room? This thing's down, it costs us $5 million per minute. So they want to have fiber that's reliable and plentiful, and they want to have electric power that's reliable and plentiful, and you've got the ultimate bait to bring them in here because those are the two things they care about. Having the workforce is a plus, having the quality <coughs> you have here is a plus, but if you didn't have fiber, you wouldn't have power, they wouldn't give you a second look. Harold, comment? No. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Let me wind things up by saying the uh, interrupter that was lifted up, not, not hung up, John, that was lifted up this morning in East Ridge was the 1,170th interrupter that EPV has mounted on both. Now, we're not through. Um, as far as we know, it's the smartest grid system in the country. We're not completed with it. As John's company and others evolve that technology, we will just be overlaying it right on top of what we've got, so we will continue to be smarter and smarter. Thank you all for being here so much.